here. Welcome to San Diego. And uh, I hope that you're going to have a very enlightened uh, time here. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get to answer a lot of your questions. I wanted to introduce to you a very, very special person who I'm very fond of on many levels. She's a terrific human being. He is a very smart, uh, charismatic, caring person and an incredibly good dentist. So uh, please help me welcome Dr. Paige Woods. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm a biological dentist in San Diego, and it makes it even more special to be here at UCSD talking to you guys about what I do. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly asked, you know, people ask me where should they go to research, where should they, they go to find out what's best for them. I know that with social media and with the internet, you know, I mean, if a patient gets a cough and they go to WebMD, they're going to think they have cancer. You know, so we're just, we're given tons of information, but who's right? And what I always tell my patients is, first and foremost, you have to trust yourself. If something doesn't smell right, doesn't sit with you right, then trust yourself and keep digging. And that's basically how I built my practice and why my patients come to me is because they have kept pushing the limit and pushing the boundaries and asking why and you know, um, stepping away from the social norms and, and then they find their way to me. So why do we need to take responsibility for our health? You know, um, in dentistry, we're taught um, to restore teeth. You know, we are given this list of materials at, and we, we learn everything there is to know about it. The bond strength, the compression strength, the shear strength, the, I mean, everything you can possibly know, the elasticity, um, but there's, n there's no aspect really on the biocompatibility of these materials, which is always kind of, um, I've always kind of had an issue with it. So, um, so I think that that's another thing that's missing in this field. We have, you know, we have dental amalgams, for instance, they contain mercury. And we'll talk about this a lot, you know, during this, this, um, this lecture. But another thing is for my pediatric patients, when they have decay that extends to the nerve, they, the standard of care is to remove the decay, take a piece of cotton, we dip it into formal cresol, which has formaldehyde in it, and we soak that tooth with this material. Formaldehyde is, it's a carcinogenic. It's, it's known to be a carcinogenic. And then we have root canal sealers that are toxic as well. Um, so there's all of these things that we're putting into our, into our mouths that, are, that contain known toxic materials. So by just stepping aside and asking, wait, what? You know, I think that that is what makes us intelligent human beings. Um, we'll get to some of these other things uh, a little bit later, but just start kind of planting the seed. So my hope for you today is to, you know, provide you guys with um, a little bit of knowledge to, you know, to take with you to, you know, your healthcare provider and, and make sure that you're, you know, getting the care that you, that you want. So the, when patients come to me, you know, every day, these are the number one concerns that they have. So they want to know about their silver fillings. Are they, are they toxic? Are they good for them? Are they hurting them? What's the deal? Just the different metals in their mouth. Root canals. Root canals is another big, a big issue right now, as well as gum disease. So our mercury fillings. 50% mercury. So aside from being 50% mercury, this is some of the things that we see every day. And just looking at the pictures, you have to ask yourself, do I want this in my mouth? Let's take mercury out of the, the equation. Do I still want this rusting piece of metal in my mouth? So aside from that, now let's talk about the composition. It is 50% mercury. And that's not according to me. That's according to Health and Human Services, which is the government. We have this mercury restorations. How did we get it? Well, it goes back a long ways. It goes back to 1833, when two Frenchmen brought it over. 
and they realized it was an easy to use material. They were able to, you know, place it into teeth and you know, restore these teeth. We didn't have anything else. Um, and patients were able to function. So 10 years later, that was the standard of care. Everyone was using it. Makes sense. But the American Society of Dental Surgeons caught on to the fact that they were the ones that said, hey, it's got 50% mercury. How can this be OK for, our, you know, for the patient? How can this be healthy? And they, you know, they wanted to, to, dis, you know, to eliminate it. And instead of that being eliminated, the mercury fillings being eliminated, the American uh, Dental Association was founded, and the American Society of Dental Surgeons was disbanded. So the ADA has been a strong proponent of dental amalgam ever since. So as I was saying, mercury is one of the most toxic elements. It's actually third most toxic element, um, according to Health and Human Services, beside, you know, behind arsenic and lead. So this is not me. This is not you know, me telling you how to live your life, me telling you something's good or bad. This is, this is the government. This is Health and Human Services telling you that mercury is the third most toxic substance and 50% of these fillings are mercury. So if that hasn't convinced you enough, when you go to your dentist or in my own office, well, I don't have this metal in my office, but if your dentist does have it in their office, this is a label from one of the containers that contains the, the mercury or amalgam for uh, placing in these restorations. And right here says warning may cause neurotoxic and nephrotoxic effects. So you're going to have neurotoxic and kidney like, devastating effects. This is the label. So that's the toxic toxicity based on the mercury content. Let's talk about just the fact of having the metal in your mouth. So if you think back about you know, high school chemistry, high school you know, science classes, when you heat up a metal, it expands. You eat hot and cold food, this metal expands and contracts. Well, teeth are really strong when they're, you know, whole. There hasn't been anything placed in them. So, you know, you can put a lot of pressure. I mean, we, we put 250 pounds of pressure on our molars. So we're, we have really strong jaws. But now you have a wedge inside of your tooth that's expanding and contracting. And it's creating these cracks. Cracks. And also open margins. So it expands, contracts, expands, contracts. You get all these openings for bacteria. Microscopic bacteria just flows right in. So aside from the toxicity effect, it's also not, uh, it's not a good restoration, uh, restorable material um, based on the devastating effects long term. Uh, I can't tell you how many, I mean, it's every day. I do at least one, mostly like two to three crowns a day just because of the fractures that occur with these, these restorations. Once we remove the amalgam, uh, actually this is a really nice picture. <laughs> I know, this is not bad. Um, but you can actually see here, you see this crack, it runs all the way across, all the way across. And sometimes these teeth, this crack runs so deep that it runs to the, to the root of the tooth and the tooth actually has to be extracted. So a simple filling turns into a tooth extraction. But there is good news. We are able to remove this, uh, these amalgams uh, in a safe way and restore them. Um, this is a case from, the, from our office. And we removed the metal, the mercury fillings, and we replaced it with some porcelain uh, inlays and onlays. Looks much better. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times my patients come in and they've done a little bit of research. and I'm really happy that they have and they're on the right path. They've you know, made the decision to have these toxic restorations removed. And they want to know how, what my protocol of choice is. And they, if it's Hal Huggins or International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, these are all very great protocols. Um, the fact that they're removing these toxic restorations, A plus. But I think you're kind of, you're taking your eye off the eight ball. Um, the key is making sure that none of this 
metal and this toxic materials is going to be ingested or inhaled when we remove it. And that all starts with a nice sealed rubber dam. This is watertight. We test it. Once we put this on, we put a clamp, we test it with water, we ask the patient, you know, is there, you know, are you getting anything in? Um, before we even do this, we add a second layer of protection and we, ha we use um, some homeopathy remedies to make sure, and we give our patients a couple tablets, and that allows, you know, if, if anything gets in, which it doesn't, but if anything does, it allows the body to flush that mercury out rather than being um, absorbed into the fatty tissues. So we have our rubber dam, our sealed rubber dam, and we place an oxygen mask over the patient's nose to make sure that none of this toxic gas is being um, inhaled. And we section out the, the metal pieces. We section it out, we use uh, electric hand pieces that we're able to put the RPMs way down so that it doesn't heat up this metal too much, and we section these pieces out. So again, this goes over our protocol that we use in our office, and we've had Great success, I, you know, um, we kind of combined a couple different protocols and, and it works. So some other things to, you know, your dentist should be using in the office is homeopathy, acupuncture, a lot of natural ventilation, nutritional guidance, and of course quadrant dentistry. You want to take care of each quadrant at a time. So once you remove this, these metal fillings, then what? What are we going to replace them with? So we have a couple different options. We have composites and we have porcelain. Composites is basically plastic and glass. It's not baked. Uh, and then you have porcelain, which is baked glass. With the composites, you know, unfortunately at this point in time, we don't have a perfect material. Um, we, we have two types of composites. 99% of the composites uh, out there on the market now contain BPAs. In my office, we, we use, we don't, it doesn't have BPAs in it, but it does have a little bit of fluoride, which we're not a fan of. We don't use fluoride in our office, but this is the one, um, this is the one material that does have it. Uh, we just find that we would rather sacrifice um, and have a, a, a minute amount of fluoride versus containing a large amount of BPAs. So we tend to go that way. You know, and when I'm talking over these issues with, you know, what the options are with my patients, I, I put it really simply is, you know, would you rather eat your food on a, a china plate or a plastic plate? You know, it's, it's, it's up to them, but it's, at least they, you know, the choices are known. So I think that more and more dentists are, are starting to join and they're starting to realize that these mercury fillings or the amalgam fillings are, are not healthy. So I'm, I'm actually really happy to see that dentistry is changing course. It's taken a long time. Um, I think from, what, 1833 to now, we're starting to slowly move away, but we're getting there. So oral and systemic disease, it's all con connected. You know, I, there's been countless of research done, you know, that, that showing that there was a direct connection between periodontal disease and heart disease. And that's been known for 15 years, at least. Hardcore evidence. And then lately, the, the ADA came out with a study that said that um, there actually isn't. But I, I think that there's more to that. I think that, you know, I, I don't believe that. I think that Due to malpractice, if a periodontal condition isn't, you know, um, isn't seen or you know diagnosed, that the dentist is going to be liable for you know malpractice, not you know with their heart disease. So I think I, I don't believe that. Um, there's just too much evidence showing otherwise. In the gums, you have a, a large amount of vasculature. In the teeth, you do as well, and it's you know it's a direct connection to your heart. It's, it's common sense. So what is periodontal disease? So periodontal disease is when we have a patient that has a large amount of bacteria that basically starts to form here. And it eats away. It's anaerobic bacteria, so it doesn't like oxygen. So when I have a patient that has four, five, six millimeter pockets, they're not able to clean here. A, a normal toothbrush can get two, three millimeters if you're, you're really diligent. 
But once we get past that, this bacteria is just having a field day. It's just going to town. This is actually really interesting. So some of that bacteria that we found in the bottoms of those pockets that I just showed you, they've also found that same bacteria in patients that have pancreatic cancer. And yet, it's not all connected. So how do you know if you have periodontal, periodontal disease? So here we have some areas where we have some pretty, you know, some moderate gingivitis, and we're getting into some moderate periodontitis here. You can see the recession, the bulbous, di you know, uh, gum tissue, and then when you get to the more advanced, and it, it we've, we see this in our office actually more frequently um, than you, you would you would realize. And how do we treat it? In our office, we take a, a little bit different of an approach. Of course, we want to use our traditional hygiene, brush, floss. But with our patients, we find that the, the, the biggest um, resource that we can have is by their home care. You come to our office, you see our hygienist every four months. Then how is that bacteria being eliminated between then? You know, I mean, you, do you clean your house every four months? No, I mean, you, you need a maintenance every day to allow new growth to attach to that tooth. So in our practice, we use ozone. And ozone is because it's three molecules of, of oxygen. When you have this anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that hates oxygen, and you're throwing three oxygen molecules at it, it's, it's, it's the most we can do to try to eliminate this bacteria. So we have our patients buy these, a water pick. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It just we want a, a reservoir. And we have them get by an ozone machine. And you ozonate the water. And they basically put the ozone water, the ozone infused water, down into those pockets. And that helps to er eradicate that bacteria. And by doing that every day, we're seeing these four, five, six millimeter pockets become those uh, two, three, and four, and even better. And here's some of the, the statistics for an ozone machine that, that we recommend. And feel free to email me about this, and we can, we can, we can help you. And again, this is just talking about the, the water pick. And I, you know, I, I even have all my, my uh, ortho patients, I tell them to use it because it's harder to floss. Um, the most important thing to realize is you're just trying to flush that bacteria out. So I don't want to say that it's not important to keep coming to your hygienist. It absolutely is. You need to have the, the tartar removed. You know, we, we learn how to brush our teeth when we're, you know, really young and we all kind of get in there and go to town, but there's places that we miss. So you have to continue to come to your hygienist and keep, you know, having these, these pockets measured to make sure that we're getting, you know, new reattachment. So aside from hygiene and, and, and using ozone, some other things that we see that causes increased uh, periodontal pockets and periodontal disease is um, a lot of crowding. You know, our teeth are supposed to be aligned in a certain fashion to where, you know, um, your saliva just flows through and it eliminates, you know, naturally this bacteria. But when you have all of this crowding, even the patient with the most diligent hygiene it's, it's, it's almost impossible. I, you know, it's, they're just set up for failure. You're going to see a plaque trap here. You're going to see it here. Um, so not only that, but these, you know, and a lot of times when they have this, some teeth are being worn more than others. You know, you'll see a lot of, of wear on the, on the biting surfaces of the back teeth. So we, we abso absolutely want, you know, of course there's an aesthetic uh, component of braces which, you know, that's the majority of why people get them. But what I care about is just the, the health of their mouth and, and eliminating these pockets and areas for bacteria to um, sequester. So, well, we, you know, and it's not, it's not um, perfect for every patient, but a lot of our patients are able to use these clear braces. They're BPA-free. Um, a lot of times our patients don't want to have metal in their mouth. Um, so, so this is a, is a great alternative. 
Okay, so the big hot topic is root canals. I see patients every day, they've done a little bit of research, and they want to know, is this root canal causing cancer? Is this root canal hurting me? Is it making me sick? It's a valid question. So what is a root canal? So inside of this, this canal, you have a nerve, you have an artery, and you have a vein. And when you have decay or trauma or something that, that um, causes this nerve to die, we have to have it removed. So we open the tooth and we open this up, clean all of this out, and fill this area. And that is a root canal. So traditional root canals are, are done with gutta percha and that sealant, that sealant that I was telling you about that's made of a really toxic material. Um, we have more biocompatible materials now, um, thankfully, that I, I will recommend to some of my patients depending on their own um, situation. So traditional root canal materials, it's a, hydro, it's a hydrophobic material. So when it comes into contact with moisture, it actually starts to, um, to shrink. And over time, these materials shrink anyway. So if you, if you think about this, when you fill this area with a material that's starting to shrink and get smaller, it basically becomes a place where bacteria can just come and reinfest this canal. Whereas the new biocompatible materials that are on the market and that we use in our office, when it comes into contact with moisture, it actually expands. So it eliminates any of that, those pocketing or voids for bacteria to, um, to enter. And again, this is the, the traditional root canal material. So, Aside from whether or not we can do root canals with the biocompatible materials or not, um, most of the patients that come in have done some research and they have come across Dr. Weston Price. So in 1920, Dr. Price did a study where he took some uh, root canal treated tooth from some patients that had some systemic conditions. Um, you know, like one patient had had a heart attack and they took this tooth out. Um, another patient had diabetes. So they had some of these, these root canal treated teeth and he implanted them under the skin of some rabbits. And 88% of those rabbits developed the systemic condition that the patient had had that had the root canal treated tooth. For instance, one of the patients had a heart attack, I mean, the, root, the rabbit, excuse me, had a heart attack after having this root canal placed under the tissue. So, not only Weston Price, but the Mayo Clinic also um, had research as well um, showing the, the bacterial, um, like the bacteria lodged in these, these root canal treated teeth were connected to some of these systemic conditions. So now that we know that, what do we do? That's, what my, that's where my patients come to me. And they've done this research, they, they have this information, they have this knowledge, it's out there, it's not a secret. What do we do? And you know, and it's, 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 this is the part that I love about my job is because each patient is, is unlike any other patient. So we evaluate the tooth. I look at their, at their situation, we look at the tooth, does it have an infection? If it does have an infection, is it a tooth that they need for, for chewing? Um, you know, if we extract it, are we gonna be able to utilize other teeth around it to you know, replace it with a bridge? Are we, you know, can we, do we have enough bone there for an implant? Um, you know, so that, these are the questions that we, that I ask myself, ask the patient, and we have to come up with a, you know, a game plan. We also look at their, at the systemic conditions of the patient. If this tooth is on a meridian where they have some other you know, um, manifestation, let's say they have a premolar that is infected and they have breast cancer along that meridian, I'm absolutely gonna say, no way, get it out. So every case is evaluated individually. Systemic manifestations on that meridian is there, yeah, are there life-threatening health challenges? Do we wanna to add to that you know, possibility of you know, introducing more bacteria into their system or is it better just to get rid of it completely? 
At the end of the day, it's just a tooth. Their, their life matters more. So here's some examples of our tooth organ relationship. So like I was saying, you know, with a premolar, any breast cancer, thyroid, um, we're not gonna we're not gonna want to mess with that. A lower molar, and this is all online, you guys. It's a tooth organ relationship. So if you have any root canals that you've been questioning, having retreated or having removed, you can you can look this up and evaluate it. So with the biocompatible option, if we if there's not a systemic condition along that meridian and the tooth is, is needed for function, um, then we do have an option. And this is what you know, I will talk to my patients about. So it doesn't use gutta percha, and it doesn't have the hydrophobic uh, sealers. It has those hydrophilic points um, that actually expand. And here's a research article basically talking about how it will expand when, um, when it comes into contact with moisture. A little bit more about the study. I don't want to bore you guys. You guys can look this up. So what's my position on the root canals? I'm not, yeah, I'm not an advocate for it. I'm, not, uh, I'm totally opposed to it when it's used with traditional materials. Um, but, you know, I like, I, it's not off the table. I feel like that's doing a disservice to my patients. You know, I don't want you know, my patients to think if they come to me, have all your root canals removed. I, I can't. I can't buy that. But each patient is, you know, they're they're an individual. They're not like, you know, they're unlike anyone else. I have to. They need them to come to my office and let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's evaluate, you know, their case individually. So let's say that we've decided to actually remove the tooth. Then, what what are our options? Do we just leave it alone? Absolutely not. We have options. So what is the best thing? We have implants, bridges, and removable partials. Maryland bridges aren't done very much um, these days uh, just because, you know, it takes a lot of maintenance. You have to have them re-cemented every few years or so. So, you know, we'll talk about it, but I think people are more um, in line with implants and bridges. So an implant is a titanium or it's a zirconium screw that's put into the bone we allow it to heal for a few months, and then we uncover it and we can place a crown on it. During those four months, the body, body will um, osteointegrate and basically move into the threads of this implant and accept it as part of the body and part of the bone. Here is, uh, you can see the threads, there's bone going straight into these. It's totally integrated, it's solid. Zirconia implants are also on the market. The problem with these right now is that it's all one piece here. Not to mention that it's larger. So it's a ceramic implant, so it has to be larger so that it can, you know, take on the mastication forces. You know, you have all these micro fractures that can occur if it's smaller. So they're still in the, um, the research and de development phase right now. Um, with it being one piece, the patient is able to actually bite on it immediately, which I'm not, I'm not a fan of because it's, it's not allowing the bone to actually integrate into these, um, into the implant. So, you know, there, there is hope for having zirconia implants. Um, they are doing, uh, they have come out with something that has two individual pieces, but they're having problems with the attachment of the two pieces. So. For now, I'm not, I'm not ready to um, advise my patients to go in this direction until, until it, I see a little bit more success. So there are options. If they don't have enough bone and there aren't teeth for an implant, I mean for a bridge, then we can do something that's removable to help them to, to bite. This is what we do in the majority of cases. If a patient has restorations on two adjacent teeth here and we have to remove a tooth, then it's kind of, you know, um, killing two birds with one stone. We can 
clean up those two adjacent teeth and place a bridge, a porcelain bridge. If, if the two teeth are you know, virgin teeth, then I, then I would probably go more towards an implant. And this is that Maryland bridge. This is um, not as common, but it's still an option. So you, you, know, you can ask your, your dentist how they feel and if you're a candidate for that. Again, every case needs to be evaluated individually. So to reiterate, are there systemic manifestations along the meridian of the affected tooth? Are there life-threatening health challenges? And will intervention improve or decrease the quality of life? Meaning, you know, if we remove that tooth, are they not going to be able to eat on that side? Um, and, and so those are the things that we, we address in our office. Um, I really appreciate you guys listening to what I have to say. And feel free to come and see us at Brighton Dental. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.